Number 432, back to this world. To those especially who served in public roles, but also to all devotees of God, the Master counseled, devotion must not be displayed before others. As soon as you demonstrate it outwardly, that is the end of your devotion. To express such feelings deliberately to others is a blasphemy before God. Now you have to understand that doesn't mean that you can't chant with devotion or sing with devotion or speak of the love of God. What he's talking about is when you deliberately use your devotion to draw attention to yourself. He goes so far as to call it a blasphemy, especially those who are in public roles, because it would be so tempting to try to get people to think highly of you. So it's, it's at the same time, there's another conversation in here somewhere where someone was being very, very emotional in their meditation or they're chanting, and the other monks complained. And to them, Master said to the ones complaining, all of you should, you know, be so um, unrestrained in your devotion to God. So you don't, Swami didn't qualify that at all. You would expect him to say something about, just something about somebody, so you had to sort of read between the lines, but Swami didn't editorialize it at all. He just left it like that. So you, you don't know whether uh, you, must, you must interpret that to mean that the monk who, who seemed excessive to people was actually being completely sincere. And it wasn't, it didn't fall into this where you deliberately express it to people. And this is, you know, it's um, having been in a, a role of sharing with people for lots and lots of years, you know, you sort of, you can tell when you're self-conscious when you're conscious of an impression that you might be making, or even the thought crosses your mind of the impression that you might be making. And that's what Master's talking about. If, is, if, if you're conscious of the thought that you might, the impression that you might be making, you really have to pull yourself back. Because if you're doing it for that reason, he calls it blasphemy, because you're using devotion to strengthen the ego. So it's something really important. And, and I, it, Swamiji was never, um, well, I was, I was with a group of Episcopal priests about 35 years ago when one of my friends invited me to teach meditation at a, a retreat they were having. There were two, two priests who were my friends and they invited me to come. And I was very new at teaching beyond Ananda, so it was just a kind of new experience for me. And I... It was a very odd thing for me to be with a bunch of Christian clergymen. And at that time, it was just before women started taking over the profession. So there was one other woman besides myself and all the rest were men. The whole experience had many strange elements to it, but one of the elements that was really interesting to me was I didn't become a religious person. I became a spiritual person and then I discovered that there were, there were words for what I was doing and that there was even a whole like community and a whole spiritual path. But it was the doing of it first. It wasn't that I chose a denomination and became that. And I don't mean to doubt the sincerity of those clergymen because they were all very sincere. But they'd chosen a profession, they'd trained in their profession and then they'd accepted it. So there was a certain amount of, they had learned how to be clergymen. You know, they took classes in how to write a sermon and how to speak and so on. So there was a certain amount of this is the way it's done rather than this is who I am. And this is just the way I live. And it wasn't like they were insincere even. It's just that that's how they'd been trained. They'd been trained a little bit from the outside in, all except for my friends who were both Kriyabans and one other man there. But... Um, the, the, the retreat was on a Monday because clergy people actually have, you know, on, for them, on Saturday they write their sermon and on Sunday they deliver it and then Monday is their day off. That was their, the rhythm that they were talking about. Since we don't write our sermons, I have Saturdays free. But anyway, they, they had Saturday and Sunday were work days. Um, and so we were all just joking and then we were going to have lunch or breakfast, whatever it was. I think it was lunch. And we were all just making a lot of jokes, and now somebody has to say grace, and the whole room is clergy. So, you know, there was a lot of good-natured, you know, jostling for position and, 
and joking. And then somehow a decision was made, and I heard this sudden voice come through that said, Beloved Jesus, <laughs> like that. And I actually began to giggle because I thought we were still joking. And then I realized that we were not joking. Now we were praying. And I sort of think I tried to cough or something. You're just like, <laughs> this was the beginning of my realize, what have I got myself into? You know, I just like, how do I even begin? But it was amazing to me that now we're going to pray. And so now that we're going to pray, we have to, if we're going to talk to Jesus, we have to put on a different persona than we used to talk to each other. And it wasn't what exactly what Master was talking about. Let me phrase it differently. It was a very gross, and by that I mean unsubtle, it's not gross like repulsive, but just unsubtle expression of if I, I, you know, this is who I am when I pray, instead of just this is who I am. So sometimes, and I've seen it even within our little family, and, and nobody means ill, it's just we think that we have to become somebody else when we chant or when we pray or when we talk. And Swami just never did. It was just always one seamless, just completely seamless. And that doesn't mean that at times he wasn't profoundly moved by what he was saying. It doesn't mean at all that he was mundane. It's that he, he never deliberately made a display. And, and from him we also learned, if anything, he restrained it. In the end of his life, he would burst into tears. Basically, all he had to say was guru. And then he would just be weeping. But prior to that, we rarely saw him cry. It was very, very unusual for him to be moved to the point of tears. And it wasn't that he wasn't moved. It's just that he'd learned from Master that you don't deliberately make a display of it. And on the rare occasions when he would, he actually, you could see that he, he, would, he would try to master himself as soon as possible. He would never uh, use it in any way to impress people. That was also his temperament, but it was, it was also a serious example to us that excessive emotionalism has to be very carefully measured before it can be expressed. You know, there's a lot of aspects to Ananda that are just so much a part of who we are that we don't even think about it. And one of them is this slightly more private attitude toward our inner experiences, that n nobody's ashamed, but it's not, it's not something that everybody just talks, at, talks about and puts in front of people. I was thinking um, of Frank Laubach, Laubach, who wrote the book, uh, what is it called? Letters of, Le Letters of a Modern Mystic, where he talks about practicing the presence of God. And uh, the parents of, of a woman at Ananda village uh, had been themselves missionaries, Protestant missionaries of some sort. And so some, somehow at some retreat they were having, um, Frank Laubach came to speak because he, he was a Protestant missionary. And the, the parents told the story like this. They said everyone that they knew, and of course they moved in a circle where everyone was a clergy person, when they would pray, you would know that they were praying. As, as they put it, there was always a beginning, a middle, and an end to a prayer. They said when Frank Laubach prayed, and his whole spiritual life was this constant practice, minute by minute practice of the presence of Christ, they said he would just, the, their words were, he would make audible for a time the inner conversation he was always having with God. And then it wouldn't so much end is that he would just cease speaking aloud. So it was just a completely different experience. Oh, now I'll share with you a little bit about my experience, and now I'll go back. And it's just such a, a marvelous way to think about it, isn't it? And so there would be no change of demeanor, because this is just who I am. I'm always in communion. So that's what Master's really guiding us toward. He's not guiding us toward a, uh, something that we put on from the outside. He's trying to explain to us what our, our, our natural spiritual life should be. And this, of course, is the way Master himself was, and he had every right to. Um, and it would be only sometimes. You know, sometimes, even in the early years, and especially in the later years, Swami would just speak from another reality. But most of the time, he, 
he deliberately wouldn't, you know, because he did, just like that, he deliberately did not want to make a display of it. Anyway, it's an interesting thing to contemplate. However, one should cultivate that experience. So it's a, it's an in-between story that we all, everybody has to work with themselves. He says, especially those who serve in public roles, because the, the worst thing that can happen to a person who is asked to share the teachings is that they become self-involved um, with doing that. And then it becomes very difficult. Swami himself, actually, he's, he said he never called himself a teacher. He just didn't. He would uh, speak of giving classes or going on tour. And he would think of himself as someone who shared Master's, what master, master's teachings. But he wouldn't say, I am a teacher. He said it just it wasn't a good idea. Because it just, it just sets you up with this mindset that people ought to listen to you and that you know more than they do. And even as beyond egoic identification as Swami was, he said, it's just not wise to do that. You know, I, I try to follow that advice. The only time I, I don't is when I'm in a taxi or something and someone asks me what I do, or I get my hair cut and they ask me what they do. I sometimes say I teach meditation. But then I'm always careful. I don't say I'm a meditation teacher. I teach meditation. About my own life, this is what I think. I had the extremely good karma to meet Swami Kriyananda when I was very young. I had the amazing karma to recognize immediately who he, would, who he was and who he would be to me. I had the opportunity to learn a great deal from him, to hear him speak really often. I have a good memory for what he said, and I have a knack for figuring out how it applies in the present moment. <laughs> and that's basically it. You know, everything else is just like the form in which that takes place, but these are the things that are always happening. And that's all that happens. I, I, one of my friends put it also. He said, I'm talking to people a lot I like about something I know. <laughs> and that's a good phrase to remember because you should never be talking about something you don't know. <laughs> one of our friends who shall remain nameless, when we were all first launched into this back in the late 70s, there's a rule of public speaking, which is called the first law of holes, which you may know about, H-O-L-E-S. If you're speaking and you find yourself um, digging yourself into a hole, stop digging. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of, our novice, um, one of our novice ministers was giving a Sunday talk. And there's two kinds of samadhi, samadhi being the state of cosmic consciousness. There's Nirbhakalpa Samadhi, which is the final state of liberation, and then there's Sabhakalpa Samadhi, which comes just before that. Now, I have just told you all that I know about those two realities. Well, this man, for some reason, chose to give a sermon on the difference between Sabhakalpa and Nirbhakalpa Samadhi. <laughs> and we, that was afterwards that we realized he didn't understand the first law of holes. <laughs> and it just kept getting worse and worse, and he just didn't know how to stop. <laughs> so you, you really have to make sure that you're talking about something you know. And if you don't know it, you can stop talking. This uh, one man in these novice days while I'm chatting about it, he sat down and he said, I believe you should never speak about, about something you don't really, you haven't experienced. He said, my topic today is the quest for God. It's going to be a very short talk. <laughs> Which is fine. You know, and it was. <laughs> but every part of it was really himself. He wasn't making a display of it. He was just being himself. And often what, when I first started traversing outside of Ananda in order to tell people what I'd learned from Swami, um, I realized how much I did know. I mean, I don't, I'd only ever compared myself to Swami. And I just seemed, <laughs> you know, just ludicrously uninformed. But when I was suddenly talking to people who, who had never had the good fortune that I had, I suddenly realized, oh my, even, you know, in the, in the mid-70s when I just started, oh my, I have heard a lot that other people haven't heard. And it didn't make me uh, prideful. It just made me realize that it was important to say what I did know. Because what I did know uh, 
was important for other people to know. It was important because they wanted to know and it would benefit them to know. And of course, why not then? That's the whole point. Why keep for ourselves? This is Swamiji saying, actually when he was saying to me that he really, once, once he achieved final liberation at the end of that incarnation which Master had promised him, actually Master had promised him that he already had it. He's, for a while he would say he was never coming back, that he'd basically just had it with this plane of consciousness. When I suggested to him that we should at least wait till a higher yuga, he answered me that he didn't intend to come back at all. <laughs> that even a higher yuga, he said, is still the material plane and he was just finished. But then he qualified it by saying, he sort of said it like this, but I know myself, he said, and I know I'm just going to have to come back and help you all. I said, sir, that's the only reason you came back this time, isn't it? And he said, sort of ruefully, well, yes, that's true. <laughs> kind of like you've already given yourself away. There was nothing that brought you back but us. And I said, yeah, I'm afraid you're going to have to come back for us. Oh, it's fine, he said, I know. He said, that's why Master told him that he had a great work to do. Because Master perceived in him that he had a tremendous desire to serve. I mean, not everyone to serve this way, to serve outwardly by giving. I mean, people can serve inwardly by their consciousness. You know, Master didn't have Rajasi teaching at all. He didn't have Sister Gyanamata teaching at all. Sister Gyanamata served by being ill for 20 years. Just, I don't know, working out her, other people's karma on her body. I don't know what she was doing. Rajasi served just by uh, being in samadhi. There's a story Swami tells of uh, Rajasi sitting, Master's most advanced male disciple, sitting on the beach or on the balcony meditating and on the lawn. And Master's walking with another, another disciple and they're just talking. He sees Rajasi, he says, shh, must be quiet. And then they walk by silently afterwards. He says, you have no idea what blessings are drawn to this organization if even one person meditates that deeply. So you, you, even medit one person meditates that deeply. So you just, you know, it's like our, our picture of how the world works, it's not, it's not how it works. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I mean, people who have a public role have a public role because it's their karma to have it. Like Swami talked about uh, Dayamata, the role that she had, he, t he was talking to Sri Rama Yogi, who Master said was a fully liberated soul. He was a disciple of Ramana Maharshi. He was the one about whom Master said, if I had spent another 30 minutes in his company, I would never have been able to bring myself to leave India again. This is 1935. They walked around, I think the Ramana ashram, holding hands in silence, just walking around, just communing on. You know, I mean, like, what does that even mean? You know, we have, we have a few things in here about how Master talks about the multi-dimensions of his consciousness. But what, what does it mean for him to be in the company of someone who shares his consciousness? And, and why would that be so important to Master? It, it's, it's, it opens up a whole world of, of possibilities that we don't, how do we even know, you know? I remember Swamiji once talking. This was, this was essentially when I was apologizing to him. This was when I apologized to him. I told him I didn't really feel that I'd been as good a friend to him as I could have been because I failed to appreciate the degree to which he also just participated in ordinary life. And I just kind of uh, disregarded a lot of his human feelings. I don't mean that I was rude, but I just, I didn't know what to do with them. You know, if he would be a little tired or a little discouraged or a little sad because of the way his guru bhais were treating him or something like that. I just, I was kind of, I just held myself aloof. What I finally realized that I was less considerate of him than I was of anybody else. <laughs> because I never just responded in a natural way. And oftentimes I didn't, I didn't offer him care and service that I would offer to anybody because I was so concerned about doing the wrong thing. In other words, I was so worried about myself that I wouldn't think about him. And I finally realized that 
I would treat anybody more considerately than I treated Swami a lot of times because I was, this was my first year as I got over it. Because, because I realized that. You know, I would offer this person a cup of tea. You know, I would, I would offer to iron his shirt. I would, you know, I would just be considerate in a normal fashion. But I held him on such a different plane that I didn't perceive that. And his answer was very interesting. He said, of course, he said, I draw most of my energy from inside. He said, but it's nice also to get energy from other people. You know, just like, of course it's nice to get energy from other people. He said, it's helpful to get energy from other people. It was such a, a simple way to put it. But that was when I was realizing, I said, I haven't been a very good friend to you. He said, no. <laughs> you know, there was no, there was no blame, but he said, yeah, you're actually, you're correct. <laughs> So I had to learn that. Everybody has to learn a lot of different things. All right. So we were talking. Oh, so that was. So I was talking about Master with, with um, Sri Rama Yogi. So, so th what I was what I was thinking about, which I really saw in Swami, and I saw it much later. I mean, I appreciated it much later, which is because he was expelled from SRF in 1962. He was 36. He'd been part of SR for 14 years since he had been 22. Would that be right? 14 years, yes. From that time, 1962, until he passed in 2013, he, he never reconciled with those, that core of guru bhais, people who also had lived with Master. They, and they continued to, to torment him in every way they could until they all died. Um, and he was rarely with anyone who had known Master. And just like in a couple of times in 1993 and a few times, uh, Bob Raymer, we had Bob Raymer come and Roy Eugene Davis and Peggy Dietz and, well, Davy and Hashi. Hashi was in her mother's womb when Master came to visit, but she didn't remember a lot about it. <laughs> um, I think that was all that there were. Hare Krishna Ghosh, who had been 15 when Master came to visit India. But seeing Swamiji interact and talking about Master and being able to look at someone who'd had the same experience, and you would see this energy pass between them. There's this uh, video of Swami visiting Bob Raymer's ranch in Michigan. And Swami gives, it's an, it's an extraordinary satsang. It's on the internet. It's called Song of the Morning Ranch. And Swami just constantly is looking at Bob because he can say Master's name, he can refer to this, and they both know what they're doing. And, and I realized that Swamiji almost never had the company of anyone who, shared, who had shared the only thing in his life that actually mattered. I mean, we were all good friends to him, but we just weren't that. And the way in which he cherished it. So what is master? Is master's like he has this consciousness that nobody shares? You don't think of him as having enough of a personality or an ego to have a feeling like that. But nonetheless, he said, if I'd stayed with him 30 minutes more, I couldn't have left India. So there's some... Uh, Something that happens. I, it makes me just cherish our guru by connections on a level that we hardly know. We, we don't really know what, we, uh, what we're doing together sometimes, I think. Anyway, very interesting. So, number 433, three. any comments or thoughts before we move on from that? Do we have a microphone? The affirmation today in, in Yogananda's affirmation book. It was? What was it? Don't share. Don't share. Huh. Don't expose yourself in, inappropriately. Is it, does it say don't share? Uh, almost. It really? Was, it was very uh, you know, extreme on that point. You know, I, I'm sure that Master said that, don't share your experiences. I see sometimes people get so rigid on that point that it, but I'm sure that is what he said because and I've had bad experiences from exposing things that shouldn't have been exposed. So I do know that's true. The energy can really be lost. Swami, 
Swami almost never talked about his inner experiences in all the years that I knew him. He, he, it was so rare. I'm just even actually trying to think when it, I mean, almost when it ever happened. It was so rare for him to actually speak of what he inward, yeah. So he, he followed Master's advice really strongly like that. You know what I, was actually, what I was actually thinking of when you said that is, we used to visit in, in Varanasi when we would take the pilgrimage groups, we'd go to um, Lahiri Mahashaya's house. And Lahiri Mahashaya said, you know, be private about your meditation, like that. So he, this extremely rigid great-grandson or grandson of Lahiri Mahashaya's was there. He wouldn't let us meditate in the house because Lahiri said to meditate in private. And, and it was just like, it was so annoying. Because there we were in Lahiri Mahashaya's house. And he would literally watch. And if you shut your eyes, he would like come over and wrap you on the arm so that you wouldn't meditate in public. We were just like, we actually learned after a while that the four of us who were leading the trip, we would like, we began to understand the, the sight lines of the house. And we would kind of like maneuver him off into a place where you couldn't see very well. And then we would surround him and we'd ask him lots of questions. <laughs> so just, he was, he knew what we were doing, but. Two by two, we'd walk to the doorway. Yeah, two by two people would go and stand in front of the door to and, and meditate, and we'd keep them over here talking. And you know, we we were shameless. It was it was pretty, you know, asking him questions and being incredibly attentive, and so that our poor people could shut their eyes for a minute in the Hiri Mahasaya's house. Thank God you were shameless. Yeah, we were shameless. So anyway, that's I sort of thought of that, which was not fair because Master was speaking of something else. What he's also saying is it's just, you do dissipate the energy. Yeah, you, do. You, you just dissipate the energy. It's, the thing is, you see, the experience is, does not happen on the plane of speech. And if you even just, even sometimes to bring the experience to the plane of speech, just, just it diminishes. It yeah, becomes a memory. Yeah, exactly. It just goes away. So it's a very fine line, but all of it is true. Okay, number 433. This is now just a complete change of pace here. One good way to begin overcoming bad habits is to start with self-discipline with food. It's, yeah, <laughs> after what we were talking about, Master being in Samadhi, walking around with Sri Rama Yogi. Um, you know, it's very interesting that a tremendous number of people start on the spiritual path by first starting with diet, because it's, at least I did, it's the beginning of thinking I can influence my consciousness. That's, no, that's not true. I was on the path already, but the, a discipline that I could understand was that if I started changing my diet, I could influence my consciousness, because for me that was easier than meditating. Because <laughs> diet wasn't so hard for me to change, meditation was trickier. Okay, so to begin your self-discipline with food, but what Master says is much more than just brown rice and vegetables. He's really talking about controlling your palate, which is a very different thing. For example, try eating a handful of hot chili peppers and see if you can resist the thought that they are hot. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Okay, they said that one night Master sprinkled he had the monks there and he was sprinkling hot chili on, in their mouth, hot chili sauce, to see if they could turn off the sense of taste and not be bothered by it. Yeah, I see a lot of people making faces like the face I would make. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Have you ever seen little children the first time you feed, feed them a lemon or a pickle? You know, and their, their entire being just goes, that's sort of, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much exactly how I think about <laughs> trying to take a hot chill. You did that very well, Suryani. <laughs> you should turn the camera around and show them. <laughs> All right. A practice some devotees in India follow is to mix everything together that they are about to eat before they even taste it. I think Mahatma Gandhi did that. I think, isn't that written in Autobiography of a Yogi somewhere, at least, or else I read it somewhere, that he would just put the sweet and the pickle and the, um, the curry and the rice and then just stir it all together and then just eat the whole thing at once. Um, before they even taste it, Master said, I practiced that for a while 
It was a bit strange at first, and certainly the meal wasn't delicious, <laughs> with those items, sweet, pungent, and bland, all tossed together. Oh dear. I found it helped, however, in gaining control over my palate, which is what he's really talking about. Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't had dinner yet, but I don't think I'm going to try it tonight. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very interesting thought, but he's trying to say, if you're going to try to get mastery over yourself, you have to start somewhere. I mean, last week we were talking about celibacy, which is, a, for most people, a bit more of a challenge than just putting your dessert and your vegetable together. But, but the, other, the other side of this is... Uh, Master saying, or Swami saying, and I think Master said it to him, that food is the last legitimate pleasure of the yogi. <laughs> so, <laughs> Swamiji actually um, always ate very nicely. And he actually would even say the words were, I'm a finicky eater and I admit it, he said like that. Um, I used to cook for him a lot, and he was finicky. He just, there were things he liked and didn't like, and he didn't like beets at all. And I was just determined that I had this way of fixing beets that I thought was really good. And finally he agreed to let me try. So I made him this dish that I thought was yummy. And he, he dutifully ate a little bit of it. And then he admitted that if a person wanted to eat beets, that was really an okay to, way to eat them. But he actually preferred not to eat them. So that was, that was sort of the last time I did that. In uh, Nalini's book, the just published book, which I can't hold up to show you, um, Transitions in Grace, which was just published by Crystal Clarity, which is, I'll give another little commercial for it, an absolutely fabulous book. You, should, you must order it, speaking to the online audience. And in it, um, it has 21 stories of, of meditating yogis, almost all meditating yogis, who died and how they transitioned and how meditation and an understanding of the spiritual path completely changed their attitude toward death. And reading the book will change yours. And one of the stories that was very sweet, though, there was this woman uh, named Leela, Leela Hugendijk. And she, for 22 years, actually, she was Swami's cook. I didn't realize it went, went on that long. But pretty much almost all the time, for 22 years, she cooked for him seven days a week three meals a day. You know, sometimes he would travel, uh, rarely. I mean, he would go somewhere without her. Even when he was in hotels, sometimes she would cook for him. Because he, he, especially toward the end, he needed a special diet. I mean, it was an amazing sadhana, and she was amazing at it. Um, but uh, on her birthday, and I don't know what year, let's see, it would have been 2012, yeah, on her birthday, 2012, which was like the 7th of July, she cooked dinner for him for the last time. She hung up her apron. The next day she went into town and the doctor confirmed that she had stage four lung cancer. So she basically never cooked for him again. She lay down on a bed and five weeks later she died. But at the very end, other people were stepping in. It took a little bit of time to get the right person. And Swami only lived six more months after her anyway. And uh, she said, she said from her deathbed, I heard they're giving Swami broccoli. He doesn't like broccoli. They should ask me. It was just so touching. You know, she just, she'd been so attentive to him. He doesn't like broccoli. Just like that. And Swami, of course, would have been too gracious to say anything. Amazing. Okay. Number 434. Michael, who later was given the name Bhaktananda, told us he had often repeated during meditation the words, I love you, Guru. One day he met the Master in the garden at Encinitas. The Master smiled lovingly at his disciple and said, I love you too. Isn't that dear? Master said he knew every thought that every one of his disciples was thinking. Can you imagine that? But also just, what a beautiful practice. Bhaktananda, of course, bhakti means devotion, and that was his way. He was just devoted to the guru. You know, we get so 
complicated about it that we forget that it's all just about where the heart is because where the heart is, everything else follows. There's a wonderful prayer that I, I've been really enjoying lately. It's, let's see. Wherever thou art, Lord, no problems can exist. Give me the strength always to keep you close in my heart. Basically, that's it. That's the whole spiritual path. So all Bhaktananda felt that was necessary was to constantly just remind himself that he was here to love Master. Because if you love Master, you see what happens is what we have to understand, and this is the, the great art of the spiritual path. Um, and you know, you have to start with some experience that persuades you that this is true. And this is where Going back to my experience with those wonderful Episcopal priests, which is, I didn't understand how you start with reading something and becoming convinced. I mean, because my spiritual life had been a, a longing that had always been in me that I finally found explained. And so I was expl I, it was explained to me by first by the teachings of Vivekananda, then by Swami. But what was explained to me it was smriti, that's the word for it in Sanskrit. Smriti means divine memory. So I was just, I was looking at something that I actually knew, but I hadn't known that other people could say it. I could just, I could just feel it. So also even what we're doing when we're meditating is that we're using our powers of visualization and creative imagination to adjust our, 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 our restless reality with something that's actually there. So it's not wishful thinking and it's not um, mere affirmation. We're actually adjusting ourselves to a higher vibration that is always present, but we're too restless to notice it. So the entire art of the spiritual path is calming down enough so that we can merge with this higher reality. And then once you're on the higher reality, you can also relate to this one. You see, this is what, um, especially the path, the way we're trained as Kriya Yogis, it's like we can envelop all these levels. And that's what, when I was talking about Swami and Master earlier, that's what was so confusing to me about Swami for a long time. It's because I knew he was on a very high plane of consciousness and I didn't understand that the higher plane also includes all the other planes. I thought when you went to the higher plane, you just said goodbye to this one. I didn't realize that what you do is you grow from it. And just like um, the root of the tree is as much the tree as the top of the tree. I just thought the top of the tree was the only thing that was there. So... Um, all we really need to do is to really feel our relationship with God and Guru. And for Bhaktananda, wh whom that was really who he was, I love you, Guru. After he did that, there was nothing else to do. <laughs> it, was, it was just the whole story. And once he was in tune with that, then he would know everything else to do. There's another prayer that I've enjoyed. Let's see. Thou art... Let me let's see if I can get this right. Um, thou art the doer, Lord, not I. Act through me always to achieve, I can't remember what the exact words, act, act through me always to achieve thy perfection while I strive eagerly to live in your light. <laughs> I just love that. You act through me and do whatever needs to be done. And what I'll do is I'll try to be in tune with you. That's my, and the phrase I love, why, uh, while I strive eagerly. <laughs> That's sort of my job is to live in the light and then I leave the rest of it to you because the higher planes encompass the lower planes. When Swamiji wrote um, uh, Material Success and Happiness Through Yogic Principles, which is this 26, 26 lesson course, which is really fantastic. And you can find it soon coming to wherever you get your podcasts because I have an audio course. Um, he was asked 
What's, because it, it wasn't common for a Swami to write a, pros, a material success course. And so there, are lots of, there were lots of other famous prosperity gurus in the world. And uh, he, he published it in India. He wrote it in India. And they were asking him, what's the difference between your course? And then they would name this one or this one or this one. And Swami said, like, like a child, I'm the disciple of a great master. That was his answer. It wasn't an answer like, oh, that one teaches this and I teach that. It says, I'm the disciple of a great master. So I, I, I had to write the publicity or I wrote some of the first publicity and I, I thought about it for a while. And then I realized, oh, most people write about the material plane from the material plane. And they know that if you can push this book across here and move this cup, and so they'll give you techniques for pushing this book and moving this cup, you know, just sort of like how to move the things of the material world. And you can get, you know, you, you, you're using divine energy because all energy is divine. But the whole, the whole of creation, the whole of the material world is controlled from the spiritual plane. And so when you, when you write a material success course from the level of I am the disciple of a great master, you're picking the whole thing up from, where, from its point of origin. And, and everything about it is different. I actually I had fun writing it because it was the publicity, I'll tell you, because it never saw the light of day, so I can only just tell you about it. But because the course was written for India, I, I, I mentioned that when, uh, I think it was even Marco Polo traveled. I mean, India was the wealthiest country that anybody had ever seen. It wasn't a poor country. It was, it was wealth beyond the imagination of kings. And then England saw that wealth and England came. I'm not, I'm not talking ancient times. I'm talking a few centuries ago. England came. And slowly, England became the richest country in the world. And India was gradually impoverished. But um, I, I fancifully wrote that the Indians hid from the English the real source of their wealth, which is that they took all that knowledge up to the mountains. They took it up into the, into the Himalayas. But now, it's can be brought back down because this is the time when spirit and matter come together and both powers can be active in this world. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if it would ever sell any of the courses, but I thought it was all very interesting to think about. So let's take a short break, just a few minutes, and then we'll come back. Okay. Are there any comments or questions on anything we've been talking about that needs to be said? Okay, we're all going to go home. No, we're not and mix up our whole dinner in one plate. We're not. We're, we're going to think about it do, doing it, but we're not going to do it. At least I'm not. Okay, 435. Across the dirt road from the master's desert retreat stood a little house, hardly more than a shack. The man who owned it seemed, however, completely satisfied with life. Speaking of him, the master said, he is like a king in his palace. Such is the joy of simple living. <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? You know, it's, it's um, anyway, there's, is it the same, what, is it the same neighbor? Or oh, so Swami Master tells the story of some man who just had a little plot of land and his neighbor offered to give him more land to cultivate. And he said, but if I had more land to cultivate, when would I have time for singing? It's, it's just, in our society, especially, of course, where we have, so much stuff that we, we just don't realize how little we need. That's why people love to go out backpacking. And one of the stories in Nalini's book, actually, is about this young man named Andy who died, I think, when he was 24. But he was diagnosed with uh, some very advanced cancer when he was 19. And gradually, as it became obvious that none of the treatments were working, he made the decision to walk the entire Pacific Trail, which is like 2,600 miles. He walked from Mexico all the way to Canada. And he had to leave once because he became too unwell. But he, he did it, but he finished. He did the whole thing. He, he did it for willpower, and he also did it because he just wanted to reduce life down to its simplest elements because he wasn't going to have much more of it. And he just talked about, I've never, <clears throat> I've never been out like that for any length of time. But you know, of course, people like that because you have nothing. And all of a sudden it crosses your mind that I don't need anything. It's just like, what do I really need of all that I have? And a lot of people who lose everything 
for one reason or another, often are quite liberated when they suddenly lose it. it, it this is more poignant than, than this, but um, Sabina Wormbrand, who is the, was, they're probably past now, the wife of Richard Wormbrand. Richard, Richard Wormbrand is a Protestant preacher who was um, imprisoned in communist Romania for being a Christian. And eventually his wife was also imprisoned for a few years. And she, you know, it was pretty miserable. But she said, and some of the people who were in prison, because this was the, a really brutal communist era where all kinds of people were imprisoned for no reason. But some society women, men, many high class, wealthy women, ended up being in the prison with her. And you would just get arrested in whatever clothes you had on when they came to get you. And so some of these society women were, came in in evening gowns. And she said everybody suffered, of course, in the prison conditions. But she said the society women, and society women by this is a type, she said suffered the most because they had no inner life. They, had, they spent their life, you know, getting their hair done, getting their nails done, going shopping, you know, going out to some fancy place. And so when all of that was taken away, they, they had absolutely no place to go with their consciousness. And so it was, it was really much worse for them than the ones who had either an intellectual life at least, and of course the best one was for those who had a spiritual life. Because if everything of this world is taken away, um, my Episcopal priest friend, when I was visiting where he lived, he lived in Seattle. He was part of a Jewish Christian dialogue group. And rabbis, they would take turns, the rabbis would suggest a reading and everybody would read and then the Christians and the Jews would talk and then the, the Christian documents and then they would talk. So he thought it would be adorable to bring a Jewish yogi. <laughs> so he, he brought me there and, and we had had, they'd passed out a little group of readings and the rabbis were in charge that week. And one of the readings was about what it, the Holocaust, what had happened to the Jews during the Second World War. But the reading was very different from most of what you read. And it had been written by a rabbi, and I don't know if the man had been through the experience himself or not. But he said, being put in the concentration camp was the shining hour of the Jewish people because it gave us the opportunity to prove our teachings, which says that the only reality is God. So everything, was, everything else was taken away from us, and we had the opportunity to live our teachings, that nothing was taken away from us because we still had God. It was interesting. There were several things to discuss, and nobody, even the, nobody there wanted to talk about that because <laughs> I think they just didn't know what to do with it. I mean, very few people can contemplate that kind of um, suffering. I, I, I personally have made a practice of contemplating it because it scares me enormously. So I've, I, as a, an exercise in facing fear, you may remember earlier, how can you tell when you've overcome karma when you're not afraid of it anymore? So by having spent a lifetime trying to face into that and reading stories of people who live through it, I won't say that I'm not afraid, but I'm not as afraid as I used to be. But, but it was very hard. Nobody else wanted to talk about it. But here's this person who has very little. He's like a king in his palace. <laughs> Such is the joy of simple living. When I was very poor, which I was in a sense during my first years at Ananda, I never felt even slightly poor, partly because in America, being poor means, well, at that time, that you didn't have a television or a telephone. It didn't mean that you couldn't eat. You know, being poor in other countries means that you're not eating. That's really quite different than not having a private telephone. Um, and I know people in America are also hungry, but there's, there's levels. But I was poor in the sense that I didn't have money. I always, my parents would have always taken me in, so I have to be fair. But I didn't have money, and, uh, or very much. But it was actually not hard, because I couldn't buy anything. <laughs> there was just, it was just like, there was just no point in even thinking about what I might need or want. I could buy, I could buy food, I could buy propane for the heater. 
because I was not capable of, some people tried to live without heat, but it was cold in the winter and I, there absolutely, there was not a chance that I could be cold. I couldn't be hungry and I couldn't be cold. But I could live in a little trailer and I could wear hand-me-down clothes and, you know, I, well, I never cut my hair anyway, so it wasn't a question of how I would cut it. I just let it grow. But it was also, it was, it was extremely simple because there was nothing, there was no point. Having a little bit of money was much harder because having a little bit of money, all of a sudden you can think about whether you can buy something or not. And so the thought of whether you can buy it becomes an issue. Whereas the thought of buying it never entered your mind if you couldn't. So I, I, don't, I don't know what would happen if I tried to go back to that kind of life. I'm, I like to think I could do it, but I don't know whether I could or not, we'll see. But, but you see, the extent to which your life is defined outside yourself, think how vulnerable you are. It just seems very unwise because we're so vulnerable. I mean, nowadays with fires and floods and things like that, I mean, just like, wow, everything had just begun. An instant, a friend of mine, his whole house burned down. Actually, this woman for, who used to live at Ananda Village, she'd been living, uh, I believe, in Hawaii for many years. And then she came back to this side and she'd had stuff stored in various places. She carefully gathered up absolutely everything that she had, finally, after like a decade of it being scattered, but she didn't know where she was gonna live, so she put it into a storage shed, everything she owned, into a storage shed, and a week later, everything burned. And she'd just been so careful, everything burned. There was one of those fires. She'd been so careful to get it all in one place. You know, there's nothing you can do except, well, there it is, but it's, disconcerting. I mean, she laughed about it, but it was exceedingly disconcerting. But of course, when you die, it's all going away anyway. There, I mean, and you have to deliberately turn against, away from it at that point. You can't be. I always, you know, in the, in the tradition of India, in the fourth ashram, at the end of life, not just the fourth ashram, but at the end of life, you walk away from it. In the, in the Mahabharata, in the Ramayana, you, and, and, uh, but I believe it's in both those epics, but there's a certain point where the elder generation just says goodbye, everyone, and they just go off to the woods. I mean, they don't, like, hold on to it until it's taken from their hands. They just say, now is the time when I need to repudiate it, and I need to repudiate it with conscious willpower. I mean, my palace, my power, my children, my everything in... I mean, my father, at the end of his life, his mind was not working very well, and he was in a care home. My mother had passed the last two years of his life. He was there. And, you know, they took wonderful care of him. It was actually, and he was, it worked, it worked very well for him. I was, oh, thank you, God, I was so happy. Because he was very social, and he was very nice, and he was very popular, and it just, it was a nice scene. And he had no, um, he didn't remember much. Every once in a while, he would remember his wife of 56 years, whom he loved very much, my mother. And he would sort of remember her, and they would say, oh, they, they actually would say to her, oh, he's, she's out shopping. She'll be back in a little while. When he, when, after my mother died, and I went there, they told me that he most of the time didn't remember her. And when he did, they would just say that she's out shopping and she'll be back. Now, I thought that was dishonest. I really didn't like that. So when I was with him, and he, it occurred to him that my mother wasn't there, and he asked about her, I said, Daddy, she died. Now, I mean, I thought I was being so good. He looked at me. She died? Because he, he didn't know that she died. And every time that she heard that she died, it was the first time he heard it. Oh, wow, that was really a mistake. Fortunately, he didn't hold the thought very long, and it went away. <gasps> but I, of course, I never did that, but I didn't say she was out shopping. I said, she's not here right now, you'll see her soon. And that just made him perfectly happy, because then he would forget, because he had no sense of time. But it was very interesting, just, you know, the dementia, there's no process. You're just in the moment, you can't, you can't keep things like that. So. Let's see, what was I thinking about in that? Oh, I was, I was thinking about letting things go and just at the fourth ashram. But there, you know, you, they kept, the room was full of the, 
the pictures of all the children and they were constantly trying to remind you, even people who had memory issues, they were constantly trying to remind you of the things that you should be attached to. <laughs> and I mean, I knew it was all well-intentioned. You know, this last Sunday I was talking about the, the difficulty with our world right now is that people don't believe in a relationship with, with God, with a greater reality. So they, they just, the only thing they can think of is, is the world based on the ego, and so they keep trying to support the world based on the ego, which even you know, leads to trying to keep people al alive long after you should try. Daniel Brinkley called it life greed. He said when, when life is over, we still become greedy for another uh, you know, year or two. His actual, his actual statistic. He said, I believe this is the number. It's, it's, it's a number like 70 or 75 percent or even higher. This is a statistic of all medical expenses is spent in the last six months of a person's life to keep them alive for an average of 21 more days. And if the whole crisis, he said, and I've had this verified in other places. Daniel Brinkley did a lot of hospice work. He was a writer who had near-death experiences. But I've had other people verify it, that the whole crisis with medical expense is because of trying to keep people alive at the end instead of just letting people pass when they pass. And, and then Daniel said, to keep you alive for, for an additional 21 days, which will be the worst 21 days of your life because your soul's trying to get out and they're having to do all these things to keep you in. Swami speaks of his own father. He said, who had a serious heart attack. And they, if they had just let him die, it would have been very nice for him. Instead, they managed to keep him going another year. And Swami said it was the only year of his father's life when he ever saw his father unhappy. He said it was just a miserable year because nothing was working. He was just physically, he was mentally fine, but... He said he couldn't hear, he could hardly see, you know, just, but, but if he had just been allowed to just go when he had the first heart attack, it was, he was perfectly at ease at that point and he was ready to go. So, you know, this man, the joy of simple living is not just something that we have to become impoverished. It's, it's a constant thing about, you know, what am I depending on? Where is my happiness? I, I sometimes look at the house because of my friend having all her possessions burned and another friend of mine who ha had a house up in Lake County and he was totally socked and ready to die in that house, you know. <laughs> he had everything he needed to get to the end and all of it burned. And when he evacuated, he just didn't believe it was going to burn, so he just walked out, left almost everything there. Absolute ashes. That happened in Ananda Village, too. We were less, well, everybody lost what little they had. So, I mean, I often look at the house and think, the house I live in now, you know, what, what, what is there that I really have to have? And there's a few things that are beautiful and, and many things that have spiritual significance. But I have a, I'm not wearing it at the moment, I usually wear it. I have a mala and I have a meditation blanket that used to belong to Swami. That's sort of, that's my bottom line. It's my, my blankie, <laughs> my blankie and my mala. <laughs> then I can start adding things after that. But it, it's good to just feel that way. What if it was gone in the morning? Okay, number 436, and this is related to Bhaktananda. For weeks, I, Swamiji, prayed to the Master, teach me to love you as you love me. One day, Master looked at me and said, how can the little cup hold the whole ocean of love? First, it must be expanded to become as large as the ocean. Isn't that a sweet answer, though? But teach me to love you as you love me. It was, it, it, there's, it's it's a, an aspiration that Swami had, but Master also, I think Master was... was trying to tell him perhaps that he had to work more. You know, he had to work to expand his heart. He had to work to, to love everybody the way Master loved everybody. He had to come as, become as, he had to attune himself to what Master's consciousness was. He couldn't just um, become like that without filling in all the space in between. That's a beautiful thought. You know, it, it's, 
because of the example that Swamiji set, that I was able to witness up close, I contemplate so much of the time, how did he do it? How did he stay so patient? How did he tune into people? How did he have so much faith in people? How could he just love everyone? And so people, so many people are not lovable, you know, by any, but there's no personality affinity, you know, it's just, but Swami was so uh, just willing to help everybody. It just, he was just, and, and he, he would just look at you and think, what's forward for you and how can I help you take that next step? And he, he reconciled so many different energies and he was able to hold so many people in a unified reality of higher ideals. And, you know, I have you know, this much responsibility compared to what he carried, but, you know, I'm on, the same, I'm on the same string. I'm just at the opposite end of the string, <laughs> sufficient to have to just ask myself over and over, how did he do it, you know? So he says, can I love you as you love me? But I just ask, how can I love everyone the way Swami loved us? You know, who, who was he? And this is where Master's saying, well, you have to become as big as the ocean. And then from the perspective of the ocean, it looks easier. I, I'll, I'll finish with this. There's a story. It's in the Swami Kriyananda's We've Known Him book. We were at Disneyland. Swami used to like, when we would go, Swami would often take a group of us down to Los Angeles and he would give talks. He did this for years before he tried to start a center there, um, before we, and we have a center there now, but it's always been a, an effort. And often when we'd go there, Swami would take us to Disneyland because he really liked Disneyland. In those days, Disneyland was outside of popular culture. Walt Disney created an entire world apart. You know, all those classic Disney realities. It didn't exist. Walt Disney created it. It did not intersect with the popular culture. After he died, gradually they've, they've just brought elements of popular culture in. So it's not... It's not quite the magic kingdom that it was when it, it was then. And Swami really enjoyed it because it was so innocent. Um, so we were at Disneyland and we were having one of our fun days there. <clears throat> and we were lining up on the sidewalk for the electric parade. And there were hundreds of other people and they were all milling about. And Swami got very, uh, just his consciousness went somewhere else. And from wherever he was, he, he's, he looked at us. We were about maybe 10. He said, imagine, he said, not merely loving all these people, but actually being all these people. And I remember as he said it, I was watching this Japanese family pushing a stroller. So in my mind, it's always been this Japanese couple and this baby. And then he said, that was master's consciousness. He was, he was, his consciousness was in everyone. And when Swami said that, somehow this Bob came over all of us and we actually literally we just sat down on the sidewalk and started meditating and we, we just sat on the sidewalk and meditated for like about half an hour and it wasn't until the, the parade was right in front of us you know that that we came out of that and then we realized that the whole um, that it all filled in around us and we'd just been this little group but we didn't even hear it because that perception that Swami had was so so I mean it's quite something when you're in the bank or on the train, or on the freeway. And you think, not just, I have to love these people, but what if their reality was mine? I, I, I've, I play with the fact that everybody has their own reality. And everybody believes in their reality. <laughs> you know, it's, it's consistent for them. But what if I could stand in their reality as easily as I stand in my own? What would that be like? to just be them as much as I'm me. It's a marvelous meditation. and makes even very boring situations quite fun. <laughs> All right, that will do for tonight. God bless you. We went from, from 432 to 436.